someone uses the term European art house, they're typically referring to a very specific kind of film. Members of my family would say that the phrase describes something shot in black and white with long shots of power poles meant to represent emotions. And they wouldn't be entirely wrong in saying that. After all, European cinema is somewhat preoccupied with long takes. Now when someone uses the term Hollywood film, it conjures up images of basic colour palettes and overused cliches. More often than not, you find that people are divided between these two sides, for lack of a better term. Generally speaking, people who love Hollywood cinema don't often appreciate European art house very much, and vice versa. Which is understandable, since its rise in post-World War II, America, the Hollywood concept of what a movie is has dominated the world scene, often sidelining other cinematic approaches. A Hollywood film is practically defined as being apolitical, palatable, and non-confronting. And it makes sense to be like that when you think of Hollywood as an industrial machine. Its goal is one of financial success, first and foremost. The European model, however, especially the French one, is preoccupied with the artistic truth behind the screen. And this is where the concept of first, second, third, and fourth cinema really begin to come into play. And it's a useful concept to understand when thinking about international cinema, because we're often tempted to think in terms of us and them. But it's really not like that at all. So what do I mean by first, second, third, and fourth cinema? Well, this is a way of defining certain film systems. It's like sorting them into genres. It makes it easy to talk about them without getting slowed down by unnecessary specifics. We aren't talking about the films themselves here, but the systems that they're a part of. So effectively, first cinema is Hollywood. Large budget films typically created for the purpose of enjoyment and profit. These films strive to be accepted by as many people as possible, and as a side effect have over time become somewhat diluted in the process. And one of the strengths of this though, is the fact that first cinema films have the highest chance of crossing borders and becoming international. Now whilst all Hollywood films are part of first cinema, not all first cinema films are from Hollywood. Now, France has a healthy filmmaking industry and creates its own helping of palatable, easygoing films. When the Western world is shown foreign films, we more often than not are given a brief glimpse of a nation's cinema. And this leads us to assume that everything coming out of that place is in the same league. And just because a film is European does not mean that it's art house. Second cinema is the power poles representing emotions film. It's abstract, challenging, and exists almost in direct opposition to first cinema. The second cinema is preoccupied with truth. It doesn't like to hide the cuts. It uses long takes. It's obsessed with showing reality, of capturing life as it is. The primary goal of second cinema is an artistic one, not a financial one. These two have been like this from the very start. Without getting into too much history, the 1890s saw a race between two competitors for the invention of the camera, America's Thomas Edison and the French Lumiere brothers. Now when the Lumiere brothers were testing out their new film machine, they chose to shoot their employees leaving the factory at the end of the day, showing a captured slice of reality. Meanwhile in America, Thomas Edison was busy capturing video of, well, boxing cats. Second cinema rejects all that first is about. It rejects the notion of fantasy and escapism. Now that's not to be confused with abstract. Second cinema has no issue with the surreal. The focus here is truth, of showing what the world is really like, even if through unconventional means. And first cinema is, speaking crudely, escapism and entertainment. But there's something that I find funny here, and it's how second cinema likes to pretend that it's above first, that it's better than that because it makes art, not money. However, second cinema only exists because of first cinema. Its rules and tropes are such because they exist as opposition to the first. Second cinema films don't hide the edit because first does, roughly speaking. If you were already thinking along these lines, then you're beginning to understand what third cinema is. Third cinema looks at first and second, and its response is one of revulsion. Third cinema is a discourse, a revolution of filmmaking. Third cinema films typically tend to come out of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. They directly challenge the idea of both first and second cinema, that film is about self-expression. Third cinema views the director not as the master of the story, but in fact as one piece of a collective whose goal it is to spread the message of activism and revolution. It can become very confusing. But the basic idea you need to know is that third cinema films aren't created to be sold. That's not what they're made for. They're an argument, typically meant to be watched clandestinely, so that any viewers must risk their safety in order to participate. 
fourth cinema I'm not going to talk too much about, because it's relatively new and somewhat difficult to define. The fourth cinema is shorthand for Indigenous cinema, and is a paper I read by undergraduate Laura Harrington for her honours thesis titled Fourth World Film, Politics of Indigenous Representation in Mainstream and Indigenous Cinema. And here's a quote from the beginning. As Indigenous cinema negotiates its relationship between mainstream cinema, it must navigate through its colonial past, neither forgetting nor forced to always speak in opposition to this past. Its emphasis on self-representation seeks to replace the tropes of mainstream cinema, and even as indigenous cinema negotiates with the effects of mainstream cinema, it is negotiating indigenous identity. Fourth cinema films are indigenous films, and it's both a big and new subject that I don't feel I can do justice to in talking about now. But nonetheless, we've acknowledged that it exists, and if you do want to know more, there's a link to the theses in the description. The point of this video was to define and explain these varying systems, both what they are and how they interact with one another, as well as discussing a new way that we can view world cinema. Now, I think it's important when we look at a French film to define it as, well, French, rather than foreign. As cinema becomes even more global, crossing borders and language barriers more easily than ever before, we need to take a look at our way of approaching it. And we're not sitting down to enjoy a foreign, alien film. We're participating in second cinema by watching Danish art house. And making this distinction gives respect to the idea that cinema is a transnational art form. It's not owned by any one nation, it belongs to humanity as a whole. The terms Hollywood, art house, first, second, third, fourth, these aren't meant to convey a knee-jerk reaction in us. We shouldn't be only watching first films just as much as we shouldn't be solely consuming second. And I believe that art in a vacuum is unhealthy and unsustainable. And in order for us to grow as people, I think we need to really expose ourselves to a multitude of concepts and ideas. So don't call someone an idiot because they loved the latest Avengers film, and don't say that someone is pretentious because they're obsessed with the Three Colors trilogy. Learn. Swap your films with them. And if you love the Avengers, that's fine. But take care that one day you sit down and check out A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. And we shouldn't limit ourselves to just one genre, or one kind of cinema. We need to learn about other people's way of thinking and their way of telling stories. And you never know, you might even find something you like.